worst case scenario for where climate and the environment might go in this century is James Lovelock's. Um, he, he did a book com, called The Vanishing Face of Gaia. He's the Gaia hypothesis guy. And he's basically saying there's good indication from past records that um, the Earth might restabilize at a um, slightly higher temperature, five degrees Celsius warmer than now, and then level off again. One problem with that is the carrying capacity for humans in that world is about a billion, billion and a half people. In other words, the, the difference, six or seven billion at that point, uh, would be killing each other off over vanishing resources because of drought and, and rising sea levels and so on. So that's a future which we can see right now in Darfur. Uh, basically, drought is war. That's, what, that's how it plays out. It's, it's resource wars, it's chaos wars, it's failed, environmentally failed states. It's a really ugly world. And I don't think many environmentalists <laughs> would be the ones to you know, be part of the one, one and a half billion at the end. It would be uh, military people. Uh, that, that's a hard fought world. The best case future, I don't think we've actually figured out yet because the, the current idea of the best case is that we use a whole lot of renewable and nuclear and everything else and basically get, uh, as a fellow named Saul Griffith says, 13 terawatts of new clean energy. That is basically replacing uh, coal and to some extent natural gas and oil. That involves tens of thousands of square miles of, of solar farms and wind farms and reactors and geothermal and on and on and on. And you add it up, all up and it's pretty horrifying to contemplate building it, contemplate connecting all of it to by grid to you know where the people are, which is not usually where the wind or the sun is. And doing all of that in a political environment, which is still debating whether or not we even have a climate issue. Uh, and time is wasting. So the best case so far is actually pretty grim. And then that forces me back to, you know, uh, why is James Lovelock optimistic? Why am I still smiling? It may well be that the experience that we had in England and, and in America of the Second World War gives us perhaps an unwarranted optimism that, you know, this is 1938 and we're doing various forms of Munich and sort of pretending to ourselves that the problem is not as deep as we thought, but lots of people are realizing and muttering to each other, you know, the problem is really, really serious and it can become quite terrible and we don't know what we're going to do about that. So there's this strange period of denial and argument and, and so on going on. But on the other side of it, if we mobilize and uh, this time there's no human enemy except ourselves in a weird way, um, so it would be a world mobilization. It could be a pretty exciting time. And it's actually something that makes me regret being 70 years old because I'll probably miss the most exciting stuff in this century as the world deals with taking hold of the planet at planetary scale with things like geoengineering, uh, with things like radically redesigned agriculture, uh, radically redesigned cities, I hope, which could be way more fun than, even than they are now. Um, it's going to be a, an exciting time, a weird time, an unpredictable time, a fast-moving time, and um, I hate to miss it.